Well, welcome to Hartford City Wesleyan Church. I'm Pastor Barry Taylor, and it's wonderful to be able to again join you for worship this weekend. We had hoped that we would be able to meet together here in our sanctuary in a modified arrangement of services as we begin to reopen and return to normal after the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, last week during our online worship experience, I explain to you how we were going to do that, and we looked forward to doing it this weekend. However, circumstances have dictated that we postpone our reopening until next weekend. After talking with other churches and other pastors, after consulting with denominational officials, and talking with local government officials, we recognize that for safety reasons, it's best not to reopen our building and have groups of individuals meeting quite yet. We feel like one more week is needed. And when we do that, we'll be keeping with other churches in the area and in their plans, as well as following the best social distancing guidelines and health guidelines we've received from local, state, and national authorities. So again, we're sorry that we couldn't keep our promise from last week to see you here in person this weekend. But as we said last weekend, if circumstances changed, we would make the changes necessary. Once again, we're hoping to be with you in person next week. Same way with two services at 9.30 and 11 a.m. next Sunday, trying to, again, keep uh, guidelines in mind as we meet together. And again, this coming week, if you'd like to call the church office or simply email us or Facebook us and let us know which service you'd like to attend, well, we'll be glad to take that reservation. Same plans as we announced last week, hopefully with a a section reserved for our older members who want to come out at the 930 service, although we would still caution our older members and anyone who has been suffering from any type of illness to consider remaining at home because our services will still be available online uh, through our website. And we'll be posting it again on Facebook as the days and weeks progress ahead. So that's just an update of what's going on. And now as we continue in worship, Let's do so remembering that, once again, the church is not a location, a place, a building. The church is people. The church is family. The church is the body of Christ. So let's worship Christ together. Lord God, thank you for this day, and thank you for this opportunity to worship you. I thank you for my brothers and sisters that are a part of our worship team and who are also taking care of our our technology, all that makes this possible. We're thankful that we have this opportunity, and we're grateful most especially for Jesus Christ, your Son, to whom we have come to give all glory and honor and praise, and to whom we give this day and our very lives. Amen. Okay, well, good morning, Hartford City Wesleyan Church. Obviously, we are not together, but... Even though we're not together, I still invite you from wherever you are to join us and to, and to worship the Lord through song this morning.
Thank you. 
today that nothing else compares to the promise that we have in you and your son Jesus Christ God we thank you for this day we thank you for this opportunity to worship you even though it's not how we wanted this week we just thank you and we praise you because you are a good God and you have this all under control and we trust you so God as uh, Pastor Barry prepares to come up here and, and give his sermon, Lord, we just ask that, that you open our ears to listen, Lord, and our hearts to take in the message that you have for us this morning. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Well, again, it's good to be able to join you for worship. And as I said earlier, we look forward to being able to worship together next Sunday. Last week, I explained to you the way we were going to reopen in terms of having two services and trying to uh, limit the amount of folks in the sanctuary, limit the way we come in and out of the building, uh, and wash and wipe down and clean up between services and, and just make sure that we follow all the guidelines that uh, we're encouraged to follow. And we've planned to still do that. So everything I shared with you last weekend is still going to be in effect for next weekend. Again, we had thought we would be together today, but unfortunately... We'll be doing it next week. So again, if you want to revisit the opening minutes of last week's video, or if you want to look on Facebook at some of the videos that I've made talking about some of the things that we're going to be doing, I would invite you to do that to be prepared for next week. And again, this coming week, we'll be posting more information on Facebook, uh, putting some information out through various social media and even through texting to, again, remind you of how we'll be resuming uh, physical proximity with each other in worship. So, we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to being together. And we're looking forward to continuing to be the church because we have been the church through these past few weeks. And I'm grateful for all of you who have been the church. You've been the church by reaching out to each other, by sending cards and notes to each other, by praying for one another, by praying for us, in leadership in the church, and by continuing your faithful giving. And I'm just so grateful for that. And we, we appreciate that so much, the way folks have mailed in their offerings and dropped off their tithes. We're, we're so thankful for that. And we just want you to know that. This is a great congregation with great faithfulness and commitment. And it's a pleasure and a privilege to be able to serve you uh, on your staff during these days. Well, this is not the message that I had uh, intended to share, obviously. But... As I start to pray about what I should pray, preach this Sunday, I, I kept thinking about, well, I kept thinking about the disappointment that I was feeling, that we couldn't be together in our sanctuary as we had planned. We made plans, plans didn't work out, and once again, we're doing worship online. Not that that's a bad thing, but I have to be honest with you, it can be disappointing Disappointing to the point of even being disillusioning. And so as I, as I prepared for a sermon for today that would somehow uh, address what we're feeling and what we're experiencing, I thought about last week's sermon. Last week's sermon was aimed at preparing to return to normal, about tapping into the power of Jesus to bring things back, even if it's a new normal, to bring us back to normal. I've already prepared a message for next week, a celebration of how Jesus has preserved us through this time and of what he has waiting for us in the future. But this Sunday, today, feeling as though that plans have been changed and schedules have been rearranged and you know, just feeling disappointed, I thought that perhaps this would be a time for a, a sermon on dealing with those disappointments that come unexpectedly. Disappointments that seem to pile on top of each other, one after another. And then we begin to feel as though, well, we begin to wonder if it's even worth it to get up out of bed in the morning. Because every day seems to bring changes, challenges, expectations frustrated, and disappointments. Well, the scripture this morning addresses that. I came across it this week in my own reading, and I'd like to share it with you. It's from Psalm 73 in the Old Testament. I'll be reading out of the New International Version. So hear now with me together the word of the Lord. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. 
Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten opposition. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase in wealth. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved, and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. And brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord God, in these moments, speak to us through your word what you would say to us. Help us to hear what you say to us. And help us in faith and by the power of your spirit to do what you call us to do in response. For this we pray in the name of the word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, it's true that, as I said earlier, disappointments come our way in life. Sometimes they're completely unexpected. They come out of the blue. And sometimes they come one after another ill-timed, if you will, and they frustrate us. The disappointments discourage us. They get us down. They depress us. And they make us wonder if it's not simply time to, well, to throw in the towel, if you will. You know the saying, throw in a towel. It comes from the boxing world. You know, it's interesting. This week, as I was doing some research, I discovered that the first printed reference to a towel being thrown in at a boxing match, uh, came in a newspaper from Fort Wayne, Indiana, not far from here, in January of 1913. The newspaper was reporting a uh, boxing event that involved a particular boxer named Murphy and another one named Burns. And this is what the passage said. Murphy went after him, landing right and left on his undefended face. The crowd importuned referee Griffin to stop the fight, and a towel was thrown from Burns' corner as a token of defeat. Well, that's the universal signal for boxing. If two boxers are going after each other, and clearly one boxer is prevailing to the point to where the the losing boxer is in danger of being harmed in a very serious manner, even harmed to the point of threatening his own life, then his trainer in the boxer's corner will protect him by throwing in the towel, signaling that they can see defeat and it's time for the struggle to end. The match need be carried on no longer. Well, that phrase has come to us down through the years, not just simply through boxing, but in everyday life because As I said earlier, when disappointments come our way, particularly disappointment upon disappointment or or, uh, something unexpected happening that just really gets us down, we feel like sometimes we should just simply throw in the towel. 
Maybe we've been planning something, and our plans just won't come together. We just throw in the towel. In other words, we give up. Maybe we've been looking forward to something good happening, and it never comes, so we just throw in the towel. In other words, we, well, we give up our expectations. I am sure that there have been times over the past eight weeks now, I suppose, maybe nine, that you have felt as though you ought to just throw in the towel. Maybe you've been looking forward to good news on the pandemic front, and it seemed as though it continues to go on and on, and social distancing go on and on, and maybe you feel like throwing in the towel. But let's set aside the pandemic for a minute. Let's talk about life. Because even in the midst of life, sometimes we can feel like throwing in the towel. Sometimes it feels as though we just can't get ahead. Sometimes it feels as though we we take two steps forward but end up taking three steps back in whatever we're seeking and whatever we're pursuing. Maybe it's dealing with our work, dealing with family and relationships, dealing with finances. Maybe it's just dealing with life itself. Sometimes disappointments come, discouragement comes, and we feel like simply throwing in the towel. I'll grant you I had that feeling this past week (laughs) as we considered another week of, well, of being on hold, if you will, as the church and on hold as a community and even as a country. But there are signs. There are signs of life around us. There are signs of the return to normalcy. There are reminders And those reminders help keep us going and remind us that now is not the time to throw in the towel. And so too, if you you or I experience things as a follower of Jesus Christ in life that get us down, that discourage us, that depress us, and cause us to want to feel as though we should just throw in the towel, we need to also look for signs. The author of this psalm, Asaph, was going through a an obviously difficult time of his own for whatever was happening in his life, and he was a worship leader in the, in the temple at Jerusalem. He was experiencing frustration, frustration to the point where he was clearly willing to throw in the towel. Now, we can tell from the psalm that what was getting him down was the fact that, well, his hopes and dreams weren't coming true, but the hopes and dreams of the, of the corrupt, of the wicked, or of the The rich and the famous and the powerful, well, they seem to be getting things their way. They seem to never suffer from disappointment or discouragement. Things always seem to go their way. And he tried to to lay that out in this psalm. He tried to lay out before God his frustration over that reality. He also tried to lay out his own frustration in trying to think his own way out of his circumstances. He looked at his life and he reviewed his circumstances and he was trying to make sense of what was happening to himself, but he found himself at a loss, at a loss to understand why things weren't going his way, why disappointments seemed to come, why disillusionments seemed to pile on top of each other. But he ultimately, before the end of this psalm, reminds himself and reminds us that when we feel like throwing in the towel, we need to ask ourselves, where is our focus? Where's our focus? Because our focus can determine how we feel. We're not to live by feelings. Rather, we are to live by focus. What we fix our minds, our hearts, our lives upon. And our focus will then determine our feelings. We see this over and over again in Scripture. We see it in the lives of the greatest characters in Scripture. Moses, David, Elijah, Jesus' disciples. We're in good company as followers of Jesus when we feel like throwing in the towel. But before we do, before we throw that towel in, the writer of this psalm would remind us what not to focus on, and what to focus on. First of all, he reminds us out of his own experience that focusing on others will only disappoint us. The first 12 verses of this scripture 
is a recitation of the psalmist's discouragements over the fact that, well, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, and some people never seem to suffer. Things seem to always go their way. And in fact, it often seems to be the wicked. It seems as though sin goes unpunished and, if anything, at times rewarded. Focusing on others ultimately disappoints us. It disappointed him. It will disappoint us as well. You know, whenever we start living by comparative religion, if you will, and by that I'm not talking about a scholarly topic for Bible school or seminary, I'm talking about just simply comparing our lives with others. When we decide that we're going to determine the, well, the success of our lives, when the, the, the fruitfulness of our lives, how we feel about our lives. When we start doing that by comparing our lives to others, that's surely just going to disappoint us because we can always find others who appear to have it all, who appear to have it all together, who appear to have more than we do, who appear to, to be able to control things better than we do, to deal with crises better than we do, who seem to have it all together. And sometimes we can even find people who we know don't necessarily follow the same Lord we follow. And yet, things seem to go well for them. The psalmist reminds us that type of focus gets us nowhere. Focusing on what others have doesn't necessarily cure us of the feelings we experience when we're disappointed or disillusioned or down. The second thing we're not to focus on is ourselves. In verses 13 through 17, the psalmist again focuses on his own circumstances and his own situation, and he asks himself, okay, what am I supposed to do? And he comes to the point to where he says, I don't know what to think. I don't know how to make sense of my life. You see, when we focus on ourselves exclusively, we'll experience depression. If disappointment comes with focusing on others and what they have, then focusing on ourselves and what we don't have or what's happened to us or what's happened to us unfairly or what hasn't happened that we've looked forward to happening. When that happens, we experience depression. Why? Because you and I, sinful human beings that we are, with our limited minds and limited capacities, we simply can't make sense of life on our own. Scripture tells us that over and over again. And in this Scripture, we're reminded that what does make sense of life what will help us understand what we're experiencing and how to not only overcome it but abound through it is focusing rather on God's will focusing on God focusing on who he is and who he has called us to be what he has promised us and what he's done for us in his son Jesus Christ when we focus on God the feelings will change. So, the psalmist starts telling us in verse 18, focus on God. Why? Because first of all, when we focus on God, we'll get perspective. Verses 18 through 20 reminds us that if we see others who seem to be abounding in this world when we're not, and it seems as though they're abounding even though they may be sinning, even though their actions are not a reflection of a right relationship with God, even though their hearts may be far from God. Here is the reality. Sin will never stand. It never will stand. There is never ultimate peace to be found in the way of abandoning God. Only in the way of following after God through his son Jesus Christ can we really experience life to its fullest. All there may seem to be prosperity in the short run for those that decide to do things their way. But we know better as followers of Christ. Sin doesn't stand, and we keep that perspective when we keep our focus on God. And when we focus on God, we also find that our attitude is corrected. Not only do we have a correct perspective, but we receive a correct attitude. Verses 21 and 22 remind us that focusing on what God can do brings true wisdom. We look for wisdom in life on how to deal with problems and persecutions that we may feel. Here's the thing. Real wisdom comes from God. And when we focus on what God can do, 
on who he is and what he knows and what he can do, that brings real wisdom. And wisdom corrects our attitude. The psalmist also says in verses 23 and 24 that focusing on God will remind us of his character. When we focus on God, we're reminded that his hand and his counsel never change. We can trust in God. Sometimes in life we get so disappointed by things and sometimes so unexpectedly disappointed that we wonder if we can trust anyone. We can trust God. God never changes, even in the seasons of life in which we think we're experiencing massive change. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm hearing a lot of people use the phrase, new normal. And that phrase can be a bit disconcerting. New normal. What is life from here on out simply going to be one big experience of change after change after change? That life is suddenly going to become something that we don't necessarily understand or can cope with? Well, when I hear that phrase, I remember something. I remember that no matter how many things may change in life, God never changes. His character never changes. He's placarded his love for us forever through sending his son to die for us on the cross. And he's proclaimed his power forever through raising him from the dead. We can trust God. And our trust in God's faithfulness and never-changing character bring us both that perspective and that attitude that we need in order to deal with disappointment, to deal with disillusionment, to deal with despair, to deal with uncertainty. Verses 25 through 28, the psalmist says that focusing on God will also show us our true blessedness. The psalmist writes, it is good to be near God. You see, here's the reality. In life, it's not prosperity that counts. It's proximity. You see, prosperity may involve abounding in things. But proximity, namely proximity meaning being near God, brings wealth beyond belief. Not type of wealth that the earth would define or this world would define our culture would define but it brings wealth such as peace a peace that the world can't take away because the the world can't give it and our lord jesus promises us in the new testament that the peace he gives us is a peace that will never fail us here's the reality we don't need to be near god god has already come near to us in jesus And because he's come near to us, we don't have to chase after him. We simply need to receive him and follow him by accepting his son Jesus as our Savior and Lord. When we do that, when we do that, and our focus is on God, when our focus is on being a disciple of Jesus Christ, when that becomes the the heart cry and the passion of our lives, when that's our focus, our feelings will come along. And find their place. Because suddenly our perspective will improve. Uh, Our attitude will improve its altitude. We'll be reminded of the the character of God. and, And be reassured that nothing can defeat us in God. Nothing can take away the promises of God. And we have life abundant and eternal through his son Jesus. We're blessed. We are a blessed people, and that's the note that the psalmist ends this scripture on. And fundamentally, that's the key to life. This past week, I'll admit, I felt like throwing in the towel one more delay of getting the church together again. More bad news about the spread of this disease and those that are suffering from it, including the heartbreaking loss of life across our country. Frustration, frustration at trying to understand the news or even know what news to believe. Dealing with the uncertainty and just dealing with the sense that life isn't what it's supposed to be. This past week, I considered all those things and felt like throwing in the towel. 
ending the boxing match, ending the struggle and saying, okay, maybe it's not even worth it. It's not even worth it to expect better things ahead or to plan for those things. And yet this psalm brought me back to reality. My focus can't be on what's happening around me. My focus is on the one who has sent his son to live within me. And by his spirit makes it possible for me to live not in response to what's happening around me, but in response to what has ultimately happened to me through Jesus. And when my focus is on that, then the altitude of my attitude improves, the power of my perspective improves, and I can count my blessings. And when we can count our blessings, then dear brothers and sisters, there's no need to throw in a towel. Because the God who continues to bless us in ways that we can count is the God who will see us through. So this is one more week. One more week of waiting and one more week of dealing with what's going on around us. But here's the thing. The book of Hebrews reminds, reminds us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's waiting for us next week. He's waiting for us tomorrow. He's waiting for us today to get us through whatever disappointment or challenge that we may be facing. And no matter what we're feeling, we need to focus. Focus on God and what God has done for us in Christ. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for the encouragement of your word. And, and for those who may feel like throwing in the towel, Lord, I just pray that you'll encourage them to lay that towel back in, into the place they found it and continue to battle on because in our struggles in this world, we know we're not alone. We know you fight for us. And if there's anyone, Lord, today who may know that in their struggle in life, they need Jesus Christ, your Son, as their Savior and Lord. I pray this is the day that they'll receive him by simply saying, Jesus, come into my life. I'm sorry for my sin. I repent of my sin. I ask you to come into my life and give me perspective, attitude, blessedness. Lord, let this be that day. And as we continue to go through these days, Help us, Lord, whenever we feel powerless or at wit's end to remind us that you are the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. All we need to do is lean on you because you are always in our corner. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you for joining us this morning, and we look forward to seeing you, we hope, in person next weekend.